This morning we're reading from Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I hope you were, were with us last week. We began a new sermon series talking about Christians in the age of outrage. It's one of those, what I call a, uh, a oh, that'll preach sermon, uh, where uh, if I read through a Christian book and, and uh, get about halfway through it, if it hits me where I say, oh, man, that'll preach, uh, it usually feel like it's God saying, well, then preach it. So uh, um, it's kind of a deviation from a normal sermon prep. Uh, I'm preaching someone else's material, so to speak. Uh, but I think it's good enough for you to, to hear, uh, and it's important. Uh, it's usually, I pick things that are timely uh, and relevant to where our society is or where the world is or what we're struggling with in the world, and, and this is one of those uh, sermons uh, series, and we're in the second week of that. So if you didn't get to join us last week, uh, there's, uh, you probably find it on our Facebook feed through Facebook Live, uh, probably on YouTube and things like that. So hopefully you uh, have heard from that. I'll mention a little bit about uh, last week. So you kind of have some, some, some feedback to, as far as where we've come to where we are today. Uh, but I just wanted to give that word out there in case you weren't here this last week. Uh, hopefully this will still make sense. There's some good word here for all of us today. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts our minds and our souls be acceptable in your sight this day, O oh Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. An elderly couple were talking with one another uh, one evening, and the husband turned to the wife and said, You know, honey, I'm just sorry that I lose my temper sometimes, and I get stressed and frustrated, and, and I just, I admit, I, I take that out on you. And I'm really, really sorry that I do that. And uh, I just have always wondered, how is it that you have managed to stay so calm and cool and collected when I get in such foul moods? And the wife said, well, that's easy. I go and I clean the toilets. He said, really? That's it? That's how you stay calm, cool, and collected when I'm in such a bad mood and I take out my anger on you? She goes, yes, I, I clean all the toilets and, 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 and that helps me. He goes, really, that helps? She goes, yeah, because I use your toothbrush to do it. <laughs> there you go. All right. Worth the price of admission right there. Last week, as I said, we began a sermon series laying the groundwork by looking at what's been taking place in our culture to shape our culture uh, into this uh, place and space of outrage. Everybody seems to be mad about everything. Everything is divisive and everything is, is a, a, a fight. You know, you can't go on Facebook and say some passing comment without somebody jumping your case for it, or you can't make a, 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 a mild political comment at the dinner table without somebody going into a 30-minute diatribe about it or something like that. Everybody seems to be mad, and they seem to be mad all the time. We talked about last week how the reason, or part of the reason why we're experiencing this is there's this shift that's going on in our culture, if, the, if you talk about culture as a stream, there are four, uh, uh, or as a river, there's four streams within that river. We've talked about how we lived in a day and age where three-fourths of that, at least what we call the mainstream, was influenced by a Judeo-Christian 
uh, worldview and way of looking at things and, and how now what we're seeing is there's a shift that's taking place where, where those who are faithful followers of Jesus Christ seeking to follow an orthodox uh, path of, 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 of belief uh, are now be, being, uh, they're starting to see a divide between those and, and the rest of the world who are becoming more influenced, the rest of our culture, I should say, which is becoming more influenced by a more secular mindset, a more secular way of looking at the world. Uh, and so there, there, there are those that still claim Christianity, yet they're more acting more like the world. They're adopting more of the world's patterns and the, way, the world's ways of doing. That's a, a shift that we're seeing in our nation. And it's creating tension because of the change that's taking place. It's creating tension uh, because of the, the, the world in which we're in. Now, uh, you didn't have that. If you were here in this service last week, um, I, I, I actually talked more in the early service about technology and how our social media is affecting all of this, how we, we feel this ease of, of saying whatever it comes to mind immediately uh, with, a, with a computer screen or a phone in front of us because we're disconnected from the people that we're talking to. So we, we see something on Facebook, it gets us mad, and we immediately say something about it, or somebody feels like they can immediately just burst out and say something about it. Part of that comes from the disconnect because we're looking at screens and we're not looking at people in their eyes and their faces. That's also affecting this age of outrage that we are in. This morning, what I want to do is unpack this a little bit more uh, and, and talk in terms of how we as Christians are, are finding ourselves falling into the traps of the world around us. We're, we're finding ourselves adopting the outrage or giving in to the outrage. Now, if you thought this was a sermon series where I was going to talk about all those outraged people out there, uh, or I was going to talk about them or somebody else, you're wrong. Uh, this is a sermon for us. I'm talking to the family, okay? I'm uh, preaching to the choir, so say, but y'all aren't the only outraged people, okay? So we get outraged too out here, okay? So, so I'm talking to us, okay? So if you thought you were going to get off, you could, you could sit there and nod your head and say, yeah, preacher, them people are bad. And that's not what we're doing, okay? We're talking to us. This is about me. This is about you. This is about all of us. This morning, we're going to unpack a little bit more about what we talked about last week. Uh, and uh, in particular, we're going to talk about uh, one lie. Uh, I, I, the sermon title is, is, uh, uh, is one of, of about um, outrageous lies. There's actually four lies that Ed Stetzer talks about in his book. We don't have time to cover all four, so I'm going to cover the second of the four, which uh, is, uh, is, which is uh, uh, I'll get to it in just a second. I don't want to jump ahead of myself. Stetzer believes that we Christians need to check our vision, okay? He says that, that what's happening in the world around us, what's happening in our lives, is that we have glasses on, and we're supposed to be looking at the world through the lenses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what happens is our lenses are beginning to fall down. They're sliding down our noses, and then if you have glasses, if you're like me right now, every single one of you is about as blurry as can be, you know? But this is what's happening in the world around us. We're, we're losing our vision. We're not seeing things clearly as we can because we're, 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 we're losing focus because our lenses are slipping. We're being influenced by the world around us. We're, our lenses are slipping. And we're not seeing the world around us as clearly as if the lenses are right in front of us. He writes, whether it's polarization in our culture, the creep of new technology, or simply the veracity and volume of the shouting voices around us, the gospel lenses through which we see the world need to be adjusted. They don't need to be down here, which we find ourselves in sometimes. They need to be up on our eyes so that we see them clearly. Indeed, we need to rethink why and how we engage our culture. Now, Cesar is not saying we need to change the gospel, okay? The gospel lenses are to stay the same. The gospel is unchanging. It is God's word to us. What he's saying is we need to make sure that we're looking at the world around us. We're evaluating the world around us through the proper lens, through the lens of the gospel. Because in some cases, we're not. Stetzer writes that the, the lens through which we see our society should be the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should understand the world as it is. God created this world to be good, true, and beautiful, but it is broken because of the fall. Because of sin, the world is lost. And God sent His Son Jesus as our perfect Savior to save us from sin and brokenness and to bring us back to God. 
because the gospel is the proper lens and the right prescription, we are not seeking to put a new lens on to see the world, but rather we ought to recognize in our lives when we have allowed the gospel lens to slip down and to suddenly our vision to get blurry and for us to see things not in the proper way or in the proper light or through the proper lens. We have examined our cultural polarization and advancing technology, two of the underlying causes of our outrage. But before we consider, uh, before, uh, we consider how Christians should engage the new world, in this new and hostile world, we need to make sure we're seeing it properly. We need to make sure that we're seeing it clearly. For when we don't see the world clearly, uh, when we don't see the world through the lens of the gospel, we find ourselves adapting, or adopting, pardon me, the outrage that is around us. When we're not seeing the world clearly, I want to get this through, I want you to hear this. When we're not seeing the world clearly through the, the lenses of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're not looking at others through Jesus' eyes, through God's eyes, the, the way, with, with the mind of Christ and the eyes of Christ. When we're not seeing people through Jesus, then we're not seeing the world properly, and it can lead us to believe some lies about ourselves and about the world. As I mentioned earlier, Ed Stetzer writes about four different lies we tell ourselves, and as I mentioned, I'm only going to talk about one of them, which is the second one, which is this lie. My outrage is righteous anger. That's a lie we tell ourselves when we look through, when we look not through the gospel lens, but when we look through these lens of our own human flesh, our own uh, uh, selfish ways of looking at things, this is what we tend to believe. The age of outrage has succeeded in trapping Christians by wrapping itself in one very appealing lie. And at the center of this lie is a bait and switch, trying to pass off outrage as righteous anger. We disguise our worldly anger behind appeals of theology or theological or ethical justification. You know, we need to be angry, uh, the logic goes, uh, because of all the sin in this world. And this is what makes this lie so powerful. Yes, there is a lot of sin in this world, uh, which should anger us. And Scripture does call us to be angry about many things. We should be angry over our own sin. Uh, we should be angry about the sin in the world. We should be angry about injustice. We should be particularly angry about how quickly we can grow inoculated, numb, or apathetic to the injustices in the world around us. However, the problem comes in and the lie develops when we ignore the fact that not all anger is the same. Let me say that again. The problem comes in and the lie develops when we ignore the fact that not all anger is the same. Some anger is righteous anger. But outrage is nothing more than a cheap imitation of righteous anger. When we just go out into outrage, when we just explode, when we let our emotions get the better of us, when we use the tactics of the world, when it's that kind of outrage, it's not righteous anger. It's far from it. Christians give in to this lie without even thinking. They, they unleash this, this outrage on the world. And they, they think they're being self-righteous or righteous, I'm sorry. They think they're being righteous, and, and, and they're not. And when we do so, we reveal to the world that we're playing by their rules. We're lowering ourselves to their standards. We're operating and in, in following the ways of the world instead of the ways of Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, let's look at what is righteous anger versus what is uh, outrage. Now let's clarify this morning. What is the difference between these two things? Let's start first with righteous anger. There's three things that, is right, that, are, that make up righteous anger. Let's look at the first one. The first is this. Righteous anger is directed towards things that anger God. It's not righteous anger if it's not directed towards the things that anger God. In Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, we read the story of Jesus entering the synagogue on a Sabbath. There in the synagogue is a man with a withered hand. Everyone watches Jesus enter those doors. Everyone watches Jesus as he walks up to the man with a withered hand. Why? Because they're wanting to see if he's going to sin. And by sin, I mean uh, breaking the Sabbath rules. They're wanting to see if he's going to, to do something. See, they're trying to trap him. They're trying to, to get something that they can use against him because they don't like him. Remember, the religious leaders of those days did not like Jesus at all. 
And so here they are, they've got this man they basically set in the middle of the synagogue for him to see so that he would certainly go up and break the Sabbath law. Now in verse 5, we read these words. He looked around, Jesus that is, looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Was Jesus angry? Absolutely, Jesus was angry. But his emphasis here is not on, uh, his anger, his emphasis is not so much uh, uh, well, let me reread that before I just totally mess up this whole sermon. But the emphasis is not on Jesus' anger here as much as it is upon the source of his anger. The suffering man was being used as a trap for Jesus. And not only that, they were using the Sabbath as an excuse to accuse Jesus of doing wrongdoing. So in one action, they had used God's law and the suffering of others to advance their own ambition. They were manipulating the situation. They were taking advantage of this poor, helpless man who had walked around with a withered hand all of his days, and they were taking advantage of, of, of the gift of the Sabbath and abusing it so they could promote their own agendas. Righteous anger is prompted by the same things that anger God including injustice, corruption, and morality, and oppression of the poor and needy, as well as the defamation of God's character. God, Jesus had every right to be angry about that situation. But so many times, we enter into things, and we get angry about them, and it's not righteous anger, no matter how much we think or try to make it out to be. Instead, it's merely outrage. Here's the second thing we know about righteous anger. Righteous anger mirrors the way God is angry. It not only is about the things that God is angry about, but it also mirrors the way that God is angry. If you want to know if you have righteous anger or not, you need to look and say, hey, is this anger match the way God is angry? Now, what does that mean? Let me explain. God does not get angry just for the sake of getting angry or because he's simply an angry God waiting to unleash his anger upon us at a moment's notice. God's not just sitting around up there kind of going, wait until he says, I'm going to get those guys, you know, you know, or I'm, ah, that's, that, that's not the God that is described to us in the scriptures. When the Lord descended in the cloud and stood before Moses on Exodus chapter 34, he described himself with these words. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Now, certainly in the next verse he does talk about how the guilty will not go unpunished, but the point here is the language God uses to describe himself. And what are those words? Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, love, faithfulness. Now, God certainly is angered by sin, but it is an anger that is born out of love for those who are being harmed and hurt by sin in the world. Yes, God gets angry uh, when, when people sin, but it's not just because he's like waiting for us to mess up and so he can slap us upside the back of the head and say, there, I, I knew you'd do that. No. The reason God gets angry about sin is because he knows how much it hurts us. He knows how much it keeps us from being that who he's called us to be. And from doing the things that he's called us to do. He knows it keeps us from being our best. And he knows it hurts. It hurts our relationships with others. It hurts our relationship with him. God's righteous indignation flows from his love and faithfulness. Likewise, if your anger is not consistent and sacrificially tempered by steadfast love and forgiveness, it is not righteous indignation. It is outrage. It is something else the scriptures teach us to be angry in the way that god is angry and god's anger is always grounded in love so when you when you post that post or when you do that outburst is it done because you are deeply want the best for the person that you're angry with or for that situation or is it done out of something something else here's number three righteous anger submits to god's role as the ultimate judge when it comes how, uh, to how we reflect God's righteous anger, we need to be fully aware of the, of the, the vast difference between us and God. 
the, the vast gulf between God and ourselves. Even though we may feel morally certain on an issue, we are imperfect and limited as human beings. We are prone to misunderstandings. We're prone to miscommunications. We're prone to messing things up. We must remember that imperfect as we are, we are not the perfect judge of others. Only God is the perfect and righteous judge. God says in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. He didn't qualify that with, but only if you don't want to dish out your own sweet justice out there. He says, no. He says, vengeance is mine, not yours. Often God's call is for us to endure. He calls us to wait patiently. He calls us to turn the other cheek. He calls us to accept loss and persecution because we trust in God and know that he is the ultimate judge and that he will one day bring justice to all situations. Righteous anger submits to God's role as the ultimate judge in the universe. Now, while God's perfect and holy nature ensures that his anger is always righteous, human beings like ourselves are oftentimes flawed and biased. Even when we are certain that our anger is righteous, our flesh may distort our vision. We may, we may not be seeing things as clearly as we could if we are not looking through the lens of Jesus Christ. In the age of outrage, if the age of outrage has taught us anything, it's that we Christians are exceptionally bad stewards of our anger. Thus, while Christians can be and should be righteously anger, we need to be far more vigilant with our anger. And to keep it into check. We need to remember that righteous anger is directed towards things that anger God. That righteous anger mirrors the way that God is angry. And that righteous anger submits to God as the ultimate judge in the world. Now, let's flip the coin. Let's talk about what is outrage. We've looked at what is righteous anger. But what is outrage? Well, outrage is disproportionate. It can come on like an overwhelming wave or it can grow like a, like a snowball that, that goes down the mountain and picks up snow and becomes this giant thing and, and, and just overwhelms the, the, the town below. It's like the, the balloon uh, uh, illustration that Deirdre showed you. You know, it builds up, it builds up, it builds up, and suddenly, pop, it explodes. It's like the steam kettle, that, uh, the tea kettle that you're, you're, you may have one in your kitchen or your grandma may have had one in their kitchen and they pour water in it and they put it on the stove and they heat it up and it begins to boil and begins to boil and all of a sudden it will whistle and all the steam will come out. Sometimes that's our anger, you know? And it, it, we, we let things, hold things in. We don't let things go and we don't turn things over to the Lord. We don't forgive. We don't show mercy. We don't show love and we don't show compassion to people. And, and we just hold all this stuff in. We stuff it down and we stuff it down and suddenly it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds and go boom it explodes outrage is disproportionate we, we we blow up on something that 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 really is a small thing but we make it into this giant thing outrage is disproportionate outrage is also selfish we often vent and rage against others because in the end it feels good we do it out of a selfish motivation we do it because hey this makes me feel good we may not consciously realize that but subconsciously it's happening we're mad if i go i'm gonna slam my finger on this pulpit i'm gonna beat it or i'm gonna whatever it may be we're doing it because it's feeding something inside of us it's feeding a selfish need and it feels good we believe our anger puts others in their place in this way outrage functions as an odd catharsis catharsis for our insecurities for our fears and our sense of powerlessness in a situation It becomes all about me and what I need and what I feel. Outrage is selfish. Outrage is also divisive. Outrage can perpetuate our cultural polarization when it rants about them or their group or their evils or calling their names. We turn a blind eye to our own sin. We don't look and admit to this is where I'm falling short or this is where I mess up. Instead, we want to look at where everyone else is falling short and where everyone else messes up. And we want to wag that finger. I remember Jim Turley always talked about this when I was his associate in Henderson. He'd say, remember what's happening when you're pointing fingers at other people. You've got three that are pointing back at you. Outrage is divisive. We ignore the three fingers that point at us, and instead we point our finger at everybody else's problems and sins and faults and shortcomings and how dare you. Outrage is divisive. Outrage is also visceral. 
is often unchecked gut reactions to something we perceive to be wrong or an offense. And so we act and speak or post without thoughtful consideration to what we're saying. How many of you have ever posted something on Facebook or sent an email or said something to someone you love or maybe you don't love, uh, but you say it and immediately go, oh, you try to grab it back. Oh, and you can't get it back. It's gone. It's out there. Outrage is visceral. It's letting our emotions get the better of us and to control things, and, and we don't keep it in check. Outrage is also domineering. It, it, it goes out big. Outrage is not small. Outrage is like, I'm really mad at you. I'm mad at you. Bad. No, that's not outrage. Outrage is like this. It's big. It's overwhelming. It's domineering. Why? Because we want to shut down, silence, or shame the other person whom we disagree with. Outrage is not interested in the truth. Outrage is interested in winning at any cost. And if I can shove you down into a small box where you can't respond, then I feel like I've won. That's outrage. Here's one more. Outrage is dishonest. Outrage often cares about rhetorical points rather than being fair and honest with others. We use terms and descriptors to tear down, disparage the other person. We call them names. We belittle them. We disparage them by, by slandering them in ways and, and, and going about. It, it, it's dishonest. It doesn't want to deal with the truth. It doesn't want to deal with facts. It doesn't want to deal with what's really going on. Instead, it wants to slander and tear down and, and, and score points rather than addressing the ideas that another person is sharing in a constructive way. Really, we need to call outrage what it is. And that is outrage is sin. When we blow up on Facebook, when we blow up on Twitter, when we blow up uh, across the dinner table, when we, when, we, when we do these outrageous things with our anger, it's really sin. It's really sin. So our next question then becomes, how do we keep from it? How, how, how do we keep from this unrighteous anger that we sometimes give ourselves into? Well, let me give you three quick things. Number one, we need to be quick to listen and slow to anger. That's James chapter 1, 19 and 20. We need to be quick to listen to other people. And we need to be slow to anger. When, when we do that, we, we are seeking to understand people rather than seeking to be understood. So many of us operate out of this whole idea of me being understood is the most important thing in whatever conversation I'm in. But if we're going to engage people, if we're going to live in a world where we grow, grow community and, 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 and deepen our relationship with others, then we need to go about it in a way that we are seeking to understand where someone else is coming from. Rather than fighting and fussing and causing a big stink about, oh no, you need to know where I'm coming from. So many times when we have conversations with people, we're not really having conversations at all. We immediately get into a fight because all we're doing is thinking about how we're going to respond rather than listening to what that person is actually saying. What are they really saying? Are we going to let our emotions just take over and ha, you know, instead of saying, no, let me, I want to understand their argument. I want to understand where they're coming from. It doesn't mean I'm going to agree with it, but I don't have to be a jerk about it. I can listen to them. I can hear what they have to say. So we need to learn to be quick to listen and slow to become angry. Number two, we need to reject the impulse to right every wrong. Some of us have a Messiah complex. Let's just be honest, okay? Some of us put on our Jesus t-shirt. It says Jesus right across from And we think in our mind, as long as I'm wearing my Jesus t-shirt, then I can go out and fix everyone's problems. Oh, my stars, can you believe what they posted on Facebook? I have to say something. No, you don't. It's not going to change uh, the world if you don't comment on that. In fact, maybe it, it's time for them to realize no one's going to give them any peace of mind or any, any word because they're just mouthing off all the time. Maybe, maybe you need to realize that it's not your job to save the world. There is one Messiah, and it's not you. Reject the impulse to right every wrong. 
People who cannot resist responding to to every poke and slight reveal their lack of self-control and they reveal that their anger is outrage and not righteous anger. I I think that whole self-control thing, that's a fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? Here's number three. How do we overcome our outrage? Well, we need to think through what we're trying to accomplish. What's your end goal? Is it to to get somebody to to, to be squashed? Are you trying to to accomplish a building of relationships, maybe maybe come to an understanding, maybe come to some sort of agreement? Well, we need to think through what we're trying to accomplish. Because if you come in full force, if you come in both barrels, if you come in with both fists, and you're ready just to take it, ah, you're not going to get to that goal that you have. Or you may send the message that you never intended to say, share at all. We need to think through what we're trying to accomplish. What's our end game? What's the message we're trying to communicate? What is the outcome we're hoping to achieve? In the Bible, righteous anger is designed to rebuke and extort the people of God, exhort, pardon me, the people of God to obedience and or to the world, into a, a place of repentance. Thus the goal is always reconciliation for God. Is that our goal? Are we joining God in that? Anger that's merely inflames and divides without an eye towards this goal is deformed. You might feel good to put people in their place uh, with your perfectly placed sarcastic comment, but this is ultimately something that won't serve the kingdom of God. I've said this before. Uh, What you say may not be as important as how you say it. You can be completely theologically correct and spiritually wrong because how you say something. Think with the end in mind. What's the end goal here? That will shape how you say things. All right. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, speaks uh, to the character of a believer in Jesus Christ. And in that, he uses the illustration of salt and light. That's our scripture that was read for us this morning. I'm going to read for you, read it for you again. Think about this now in terms of what we've just been talking about. This is Jesus talking to us. And here he is really speaking to us in this age of outrage. Uh, and he did this 2,000 years ago. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds, your good posts, your good tweets, your good comments, your good input your good words, and your good deeds, so they may see them and glorify your Father in heaven. Salt gives flavor to food. It makes food taste good. Our words, our actions, our social media posts, our tweets should not leave people with a bad taste in their mouth. The light we shine is the light of Christ residing inside of us. This dark world is desperately looking for a light of hope and peace and love and grace, a light that is compassionate. We need not cover that light up with a basket or a bowl that's labeled outrage because it will not let our light shine if we cover it up. So how can we keep ourselves from giving in to outrage? Well, we can be quick to listen and slow to anger. We can learn to reject the impulse to to put on the Jesus t-shirt and be the savior of the world and have to respond to everything. We can can think through what we're trying to accomplish and see what is best for the end goal that God has for us. If we can do these things, we will be far better off. And the world will be too. So go. Go. Be the person that God has called you to be, whether it's online or offline, whether it's across the dinner table from relatives, even if it's that crazy Uncle Larry who always has to make those political comments, 
Love them with a love that comes from Christ. See them as Christ sees them, as people in need of saving. Join God in what he's doing in this world to make a difference. Don't hide his light. Don't let outrage control you. But live by the Spirit. Amen.